Welcome to The Hill's Coronavirus Report. I'm Steve Clemens, Editor-at-Large of The Hill. Each day we are interviewing consequential leaders in the battle against the coronavirus. Sometimes these leaders are doctors, nurses, in medicine or science, are social organizers and volunteers, and occasionally government officials. And in my book, some of the most interesting of these are economic strategists and regulators. The civic and economic side of the COVID-19 fight is becoming more important as we discuss opening the economy and as we consider taking on more and more debt to hold things together. My next guest can offer some perspectives on the economic and the social psychological side of the COVID equation. Six years ago, he literally wrote the book on what we're facing called The Next Economic Disaster, Why It's Coming and How to Avoid It. He has been working with the governor of Pennsylvania, Tom Wolf, on the governor's cabinet on how to get the balance right in thinking about restarting the economy and protecting the public from a next battle with the coronavirus. Richard Vague, the Secretary of Banking and Securities for the state of Pennsylvania, thank you so much for joining me. Richard, let me just ask you, you have written a lot about economic crises and about debt, both public sector debt and private sector debt. Did you ever imagine that a pandemic would be the thing that would come in and gut punch the U.S. economy and reveal all the problems that we have inside these kinds of things that you've been writing about for quite a long time? Uh, certainly didn't expect something of this magnitude with this kind of consequence. But we do have precedents. The Depression of 1920 uh, had at part and parcel of it the Spanish flu pandemic that lasted from 1918 through 1920. And when you look at the state of Pennsylvania today and how it's doing, uh, what are you most worried about? What are, is on your radar screen when you look at the economy and you look at the tension with what's going on in the public health front? You know, the bankers in Pennsylvania and across the country have been doing a terrific job stepping up, working with customers. A huge part of that is the Treasury's $350 billion for small businesses. But as you know, uh, that has been entirely used at this point in time. And we understand there's as many or more applications that did not get processed and did not get funded than did get funded. And that implies that there's a need that might be at least another $350 billion, if not far more than that, that needs to be met, and it needs to be met quickly. We just had on another uh, Hill TV show uh, called Rising an interview uh, with an editor from the American Prospect magazine. And, and this editor was very critical of the way the governance is set up right now on these small business loan programs because he says the banks have no, um, you know, there's no real cash, there's no uh, governance, for, very little governance for the process of looking at how these loans are getting out there because there's such demand. But at the same time, they are able to rack up lots of fees. Are you worried that the incentives are misaligned right now on getting those loans out the door? I don't see it that way at all. I think uh, the bankers are, uh, the interest rate on these loans is very low. There is a processing fee. These banks are working 16 to 20 hours a day to try to get these things done. Uh, the system is, has all sorts of operating difficulties with us. I think that uh, the incentives, if anything, they, either they're appropriate or they're not quite sufficient. Uh, but the objective, as you recall, would be to get money in the hands of small businesses. And we're doing that, we just need to do a lot more of that. Richard, I wanna read something to you that I read in March in Psychology Today. It's a fascinating treatment of the way to look at this virus. Um, and this was written by a, a gentleman named Samuel Paul Vessier. He wrote, COVID-19 is turning out to be a remarkably intelligent evolutionary adversary. By exploiting vulnerabilities in human psychology selectively bred by its pathogen ancestors, it has already shut down many of our schools, crashed our stock market, increased social conflict and xenophobia, reshuffled our migration patterns, and so on. We should pause to remark that COVID-19 is extraordinarily successful epidemio epidemiologically, uh, precisely because it is not extremely lethal. In other words, it's not killing us at a level where, where it would kill all its hosts, but it is paralyzing our society. I found it a very interesting way to look at a pandemic and what it's doing to us socially as opposed to physically. And I know that you're a student of history. Um, you look at these questions, and I'm interested in the social resilience dimension of this. What do we have to do in terms of shoring up society and economic resilience in a way that we're not doing now that is kind of missing uh, what COVID-19 is really doing to us? 
You know, the, the consequences are profound, but I am extremely optimistic about the resilience of the human spirit. I have no doubt whatsoever, and I see all around me people coalescing in new ways to, to provide uh, comfort and rejuvenation to each other. I have no concerns about that. We are resilient. We will do well. I have enormous concerns about getting cash and support out to uh, individuals out that are unemployed. They're having difficulty finding, you know, funding their next meal. That's where the pressure is. Now, I understand the Pennsylvania State Senate the other day voted to overturn the governor's stay at home orders. Um, I don't know what the rules in Pennsylvania are about who wins in that struggle. You maybe, you know, shine some light on that. But I also think there's an interesting question here about a tug of war between those people who want to open the economy, get people back to work basically tomorrow, uh, and those that say, you know what, we can't do this if we, if we uh, run the risk of expanding this epidemic further um, and seeing deaths and, and further um, infections rise. So how are you looking at that, and what is the state of play in Pennsylvania right now? You know, there is, health is the priority. And Governor Wolf has been tremendously courageous in the uh, face of all sorts of pressure in making sure health is our priority. And we see reasons for concern. Singapore is something we've all seen over the last few days. They were very successful early on. They reopened too quickly and cases are skyrocketing in Singapore. We don't want that to happen. But what I can tell you is an enormous amount of planning is going on at the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania uh, planning level on how to reopen and keep folks safe from a health standpoint. So I think you're going to see a lot of great precautions built into the system as we reopen that allow us to begin to operate again, if you will, and remain safe. Uh, I think we're going to see that hopefully sooner rather than later. Now, I know it's hard as a government official, as a secretary in the governor's cabinet, uh, to be self-critical, but I'm interested in what blind spots you think the current government has in dealing with this. You know, I think uh, I won't be critical of the state of, uh, or the Commonwealth of Pen Pennsylvania because I think I see all my colleagues working so hard to get things done. I think the issue, whether it's at the state or the nation or the world, is exactly the same issue, and that's funding. And the central banks and the federal government are the mechanism for getting funding out. We need more. My own estimate is that in the first uh, set of uh, actions by Congress, we probably got a quarter to a third of what it's going to take uh, to get it all working again. We need more and we need it very quickly. Well, you wrote an op-ed for The Hill not too long ago, and in that op-ed, you talked about the resource level that was going to be needed and what we needed to do to get ha uh, money in the hands of, of real people where they are now and on a repeated basis until uh, we were through this. And as I read your piece again uh, last night and I looked at the stimulus package, there seems to be a huge gap uh, despite that, that package being $2 trillion, but a huge gap between what you said we needed and that stimulus package. So I'd love to kind of get your sort of chapter two thoughts, if you will, on what you think we need to do to get um, to shore up people and also to get the economy going. You know, I think the amount that we need, we still need is at least a couple of trillion more, maybe more than that. And the most effective way to do that is going to be to increase and extend the checks that get directly in the hands of consumers and to increase and extend the funding support, such as the uh, SBA payment payroll protection plan. Those are the things needed. What I can also tell you is that states and municipalities are going to need a lot of support very quickly and able to, to be able to continue to provide the services that are so critical across the state from a health care and education and payroll standpoint. So we need all that. And frankly, you know, getting it a month or two or three from now is going to compound the damage. We need it this week. We need it next week. You know, I'm interested in the questions of what our social contract is going to look like in the future with, with working families and, and, and you know, people are out there. And there's been, um, 
you know, whether it's been automation and technology, whether it's been offshoring and trade, there's been sort of a steady drumbeat against workers for a long time in the United States. And sometimes when you have moments like this, as you've written during the Great Depression, after that you had all sorts of institutions created and essentially a new social contract put together by Roosevelt or later by uh, Lyndon Johnson. And I'm interested in whether or not uh, people in your position are looking at this as an opportunity, this crisis as an opportunity to rewire how the economy works and to, and to shore up some of the problems that we have had with uh, stagnant wages, uh, with what was beginning to evolve in the gig economy. Is that on your radar at all? You know, people are consumed with just the day-to-day -day of getting back up and running. The number of details that are going to be involved in getting the current economy restarted may, are going to be many and perhaps even a little overwhelming. So I'm not sure there's the opportunity. But I tell you, folks' mindsets are going to be different uh, as we exit this crisis. You know, one of the things I've advocated uh, for some time is the United States ought to be uh, teaching and training uh, workers that are already 30 and 40 and 50 years old, new skills, better skills. And we ought to be training not 10,000 people a year, but a million people a year or 2 million people a year. You know, that's something that we were proposing last year and the year before as a way to address the exact thing that you're talking about. Now, I don't think that's that expensive. You know, it would have been 10 billion a year or 20 billion a year or something like that. That that felt daunting, you know, a year ago. Today, I think, you know, our, our feelings about cost have been rescaled. And we understand something like that is, in fact, very affordable. You know, one of the things we've seen in this crisis are mayors and governors are real standouts um, as those who seem to be making executive decisions, uh, tough decisions to get through this crisis. And there's been a lot of criticism of the federal government uh, and particularly the White House. How do you, in the executive branch of the uh, uh, government in the, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, uh, look at the actions of the federal government today? You know, I think governors across the country have been real heroes, and Tom Wolf has been. Uh, you know, at the very forefront of the heroic, courageous behavior that's going on. I think the federal government, um, in terms of the executive branch, has been slow to act. They're still not acting uh, with the full powers that they have at their, at the, at their beck and call. Uh, the Fed has been extraordinary. The Fed has done more in a month or two than it did in a year or more in the last crisis. Mm. Uh, they, they have been in my mind, at the federal level, the real heroes. Uh, Congress has begun a process. They need to do a lot more. Uh, the executive branch has been slow to get resources out, and I think the acceleration of the deployment of resources is something that the executive branch could be facilitating far more than they are at this moment. You, you, in our last couple of minutes here, Richard, I'd love to get your thoughts on debt. You've written more than anyone I know on private sector debt. But we're about to see the uh, uh, accumulated national government debt of the United States surpass the size of its entire economy. You've asked for many trillions uh, of more uh, in terms of a next set of stimulus packages. People have begin thinking about a new round of infrastructure and how you get the economy going after this uh, uh, slice of life in, during the coronavirus. And I'm interested in should we be worried about that, that level of debt that is growing and even before the crisis happened, uh, because of the Trump tax plan and other reasons, you know, our coffers were, were empty and the level of debt was skyrocketing in this country even before this hit. So give us, you know, the Richard Vague take on that level of debt today. As regards government, federal government debt specifically, make no mistake, we have ample capacity to do what we need to do. Government debt to GDP was about 106% on December 31st of 2019. In Japan, it's 238%. That gives you a sense of how far we could continue to go and still have additional capacity. I think even with all that's in the pipeline, the uh, federal government debt to GDP will be a, about 130%, per, perhaps. Uh, that is not a level that is a problematic level. We still have ample capacity. There's any number of theorists who've shown uh, that. 
uh, the spending at the government level creates identical assets or wealth in the private sector. And that's actually uh, the way the accounting for that works. The other thing that I would be sure and mention is people worry about inflation uh, as a result of this. All of our research has shown that the opposite is what we ought to be concerned at. Rising debt levels over the last 40 years had invariably resulted in lower interest rates, not higher interest rates. I think that will continue to be the case. I think interest rate, the pressure on interest rates will be for them to go lower. I think there'll be deflation, and that's what we need to be concerned about. Well, Richard Vague, Acting Secretary for Banking and Securities for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for joining me for the Hills Coronavirus Report. Have a good weekend and be well.